Okay, um, a couple of things. My battery is running low in my microphone. I have some new ones here. So if I cut out, can one of you shout at me that I need to change over the batteries? Um, hopefully this will last through class and I can change them out tomorrow. But just in case I go quiet, you know that ain't happening. So um, you can turn the mic on, give me a yell, tell me that you can't hear me anymore. Okay? Um, and then the other thing, where did, um, I know that um, Ryan ran the video recording from last semester on Thursday because I had to um, do some work for my chair. Um, where did I get to? I should have started chapter three in there. So I'm not sure how far I got. Um, had I started Newton's second law? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, Dr. Wall. Okay. Which slide did I get to in that recording last week? I think it was like in the middle. Sure, I would have finished Newton's first law. Did I start Newton's second law? Did I get that finished and get to third law? I think you finished the second law. Okay, let's start. I think so. Okay, thank you. Let's start here then. Okay, so um, we'll pick up and look at these. So, quick review: the first law is that if an object is in motion, it will stay in motion unless it's acted upon by a force. If the object is stationary, it will stay stationary unless acted on by a force. Right? That's the the topic of the first law. The second law is to do with the relationship between force and mass and acceleration of the object. All right, so F equals MA. And the third law um, is often the one that um, students have heard of and maybe not realized it's one of Newton's laws, but it's um, a kind of saying that crops up in everyday language as well, that for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. Okay, So that means that if I push on something, it starts to push back on me. Okay, So I have this picture here of footprints in the sand because um, I think that this is a, a very um, a, a very uh, usable example to show how this works. Okay, so 
If I am walking across the classroom, do I leave footprints on the carpet? We have a very, very low, it's really like tile. Okay. If you have you can. So if I walk here, am I leaving footprints? No. No, right? Not on this surface. And that's because this surface, the surface tension and the force pushing back is equal or greater than the force that I'm pushing down with, right? So there's no footprint there. But when we walk in the sand, right, the, the tension and the force production of the sand is less than the force production that we use to walk. And so we sink slightly into the surface, right? Because this force that's pushing back isn't quite managing to hold us on the top of the surface. And so we sink in, right? And that leaves a footprint, okay? So this idea that, that what we are pushing into is pushing back on us. represents this law. Alright? Okay, so our oppositional movements, and we'll talk a bit more about those in the chapter that's starting later this week, um, can help us with force generation. So let's have a look at these videos, which I didn't set up ahead of time, which was a bit silly. Uh, So, by swinging his arms in opposition to his legs, right, for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. So it adds force. Actually, this technique that you're seeing this young man, his arms are crossing across the front of his body a little bit, I think. Um, which means he's applying force in the wrong plane of motion. Right? We want to, um, if we want to run as fast as possible, right? so if you watch a 100 meter or 200 meter sprinter, right, they're very disciplined about their arm action. Okay? It's absolutely in the plane of motion because they want to go forwards as fast as possible. Now if you watch a marathon or a 10K, where speed isn't really the goal, right? The goal is endurance and getting there, getting to the end of the race. Then you see slightly different arm action because this might be a bit more comfortable. And since speed isn't the key here, right? It doesn't impact performance as much in the longer races. Does that make sense? So if I apply force kind of at diagonals to my plane, it doesn't impact 
a 10k or a marathon performance. But if I did this in 100 meters, that would that would totally impact the speed that I could finish that 100 meters in. Does that make sense? Hopefully, that example makes sense. Um, let's have a look at this other clip. <coughs> So then this example um, of this clip is quite interesting here because she's swinging her arms the wrong way really for a long jump. You can use that backward, um, backward arm swing if what you want is high and you time it just right to get transfer of momentum. So sometimes if you watch um, gymnasts, some gymnasts on their uh, front tumbling runs will use this arm action into a front somersault because if you time it then, and you stop your arms at the same time as you jump, it transfers momentum and height into the somersault. But to do this, when what you want to do is go forwards, is not beneficial, right? I'm, I've got, it's in the right plane, but it's in the wrong direction. I want to add arm swing and force into my jump so I jump further. Okay. Let's just watch her one. Right? And she actually jumped quite fast, so just imagine what would happen if you got her arm swing correct. you every one of these videos. You, you have access to them at the Human Kinetics website. So I'll jump in and out. I'll show some of them, but not all of them. All right. So here's what I was talking about. We want to use all the force that we're producing into the plane of motion that we want to move ourselves or an object. So uh, another example of this, uh, to avoid rotational movements. So another example of this is if you watch people running from behind, right? And as they push off, they get a, a weird kind of lower leg outward swing. Then they're applying force in slightly the wrong, they're adding not just pushing backwards, but they're also pushing to the side a little bit, right? So they're pushing in and the floor is pushing them, their leg out the other way because it's opposite reaction, okay? So if you're seeing that and you're teaching this person and you're seeing this funny kind of rotation, uh oh, I think, my battery is dying. Hang on, let me just change this out. I see it flashing. I don't want it to completely crash. This thing goes through the batteries. Pushing straight back 
and not pushing back and in a little bit, right? Because they're wasting some of their force production out of the plane motion. So often in sport, what we're looking for is to increase velocity, right? And velocity is speed with a given direction, right? So in everyday language, um, biomechanists get a bit mad, but in everyday language, we often uh, interpose speed and velocity. It's not technically correct to do that, okay? So, we often want to uh, get more velocity on the ball, for example, because more velocity means the ball will go further, okay, in a shorter period of time. So, one of the things that we can do, so if I'm throwing, alright, then, or even if I'm running, then there's often rotation occurring in one or two limbs, right? So if I'm throwing, there's rotation of the arm. If I'm running, there's rotation of the leg. It's not a full circle, hopefully. That wouldn't be very comfortable. But, you know, we've got part of a circle, so there is some rotation in running, right? So we can increase the linear velocity by increasing the, um, uh, sorry, yeah, the rotational velocity, right? So, hold on, where's my notes here? So I have to draw you a diagram here, right? So we can increase rotational velocity and that will increase linear velocity. So let me show you this. Let's have one of these. All right. So you, sh you, you might remember this from school. Right? If I am swinging something, an object, around in a circle. Right? So let's say that this is going this way, right? I'm, I'm the person standing in the middle, and I'm turning round and round and round, and I've got a bean bag on the end of a string, right? And I'm turning around in a circle, and the bean bag is swinging out on the circumference of the circle, when I let go of the string, does anybody remember where the beanbag goes in relation to the circle from school? Might have been a long time ago that you did this. Or you might not have done it. I guess it depends what classes you took at school. Alright, so what happens is when I release the string, the beam bag flies off. Oh um, no, that's not let me do this. Let me use a different color now because that's wrong. Let's use green. The beam bag flies off at a tangential path to the circle at the point at which you released it. So we have an equation that we can use here that is linear velocity, and these are my symbols so I might not be using the right symbols but they're the ones that help me remember this. Linear velocity equals rotational velocity multiplied by the radius of rotation, 
which is from the center to the circumference. Okay, and then I do a little squiggly symbol and an R. <laughs> That's how I remember radius of rotation. All right, so I'm swinging around. So of course the perfect sport example is, and I can't think the name of it now, is the one where they're in the cage and they have a long wire and a weight on the end and they go round and round and round and then release, right? So it's one of the field events at the Olympics and World Championships. Why can't I think of the name of it? Oh, getting old is a nuisance. Remember it goes all kaplooey. Are you talking about a discus? No, because, well, kind of discus would be the same idea. But maybe maybe the hammer. Hammer, right? that's the one, Neri, thank you, hammer. Discus is the same idea, but in discus, your arm is the string, right? But it's the same idea. Hammer, that's the one, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's the perfect sporting example of this concept, but the concept applies in all kinds of different situations, okay? So, one of the things we see 
with children who are still growing, right, that we have to be a little bit careful of from an assessment point of view, is that sometimes they start throwing the ball further because they went through a growth spurt and their arm got longer. Right? So they threw the ball further, but their motor development hasn't improved. Their technique isn't any better. Their, their competency at the movement pattern of the skill did not improve. But their arm got longer, and therefore the ball went further. Right? So that's one of the things we have to look out for. It's, it's a major reason why I don't like product assessment, because I'm not, the outcome doesn't tell me whether or not the movement pattern is competent, right? Not always. The outcome can tell fibs sometimes. I'm much more interested in the process of the skill than the outcome of the skill. Right? Okay, I do want to show you these because this is quite interesting, this little bit. similar picture where the child is trying to kick a ball that's too big for them. it with his knee rather than his foot, right? But see, his leg is still bent there as the ball is leaving his toe. So it's not the best example of what I want you to see here because the, that ball is way too big for him. But you can see that that is not going to go very fast. away relatively slowly. Now let's watch this one. Okay. So he has quite an interesting action here. Uh, he looks like a rugby player who is starting off the play with a kick. Um, possibly, I don't know if they do a similar um, start in American football. Um, okay. So let's see if I can... Right? 
So the leg is straight, and so that's going to increase the velocity on that ball. So when we talked about inertia, um, I'm pretty sure I would have covered inertia in that video last week. Um, we said that inertia is related to the mass of the object, right? How hard is it to move that object, okay? So when we look at the idea of inertia in rotation, it's based on the mass and the rotational radius. Okay? So, a question that's quite interesting is why, it, um, if you go back and watch the older chap, it's a little more obvious, but if we know that a straight leg applies the most velocity to the ball, why don't we swing the leg straight? Why is it that we have this bend at the back and then we have to time straightening the leg as we make contact with the ball, right? So, what, what, the, what the biomechanist would say there is that that would, that would create way too many problems mechanically to keep the leg straight through the whole swing. It would use a lot more energy. So by bending the leg, I can swing the leg without using so much energy. And then I have to get this extension timing dead right. And that's part of the skill set for the kick. right? So it would have too much inertia, it would be too hard to move it straight, and it would use too much energy. So we have a bend and a swing and an extension at contact. Right? Same idea I imagine in tennis. Okay? I could swing my arm straight and hit the ball. Right? But that uses a lot of energy and puts a lot of strain on the shoulder. It's easier to time the extension correctly at contact with the ball. Okay. So another concept that comes to play a lot, and remember these are all biomechanical ideas. When you take HPE 312, you'll do these in a lot more detail. But the chapter three is trying to introduce you to some of the most important concepts in biomechanics that apply directly to our observation of motor development. Right? Because all the movement that you see has to follow the laws of physics and biomechanics. Right? So another one that's an important concept is force absorption. Right? So if I want to stop something that's moving, remember law number one, right? If it's in motion, and we want to stop it or change its direction, we have to apply force to it, okay? So to make an object stop, we have, again, a couple of techniques, a couple of options that we can use to stop an object that is moving, okay? One is that we increase 
the time over which the force is applied. Okay? So, my example here is a landing in gymnastics. So there's a couple of uh, different things at play there. One is when you watch someone land from up in the air, right? Is that they bend their knees. So by bending, I have flexion at the hip joint, flexion at the knees, flexion at the ankle. That takes time and it means the force of the pushback from the floor is spread over that time, all right? So, when you stand up and you're done with this lecture, I want you to try a little trick, all right? Be careful with it though, because I don't want you to hurt yourselves, okay? All right, so I want you to stand up and I want you to jump, just a little itty bitty jump, nothing big. Right. Do a jump and land straight legged and see what that feels like and then do the same jump and bend your legs when you land and see how it changes what that feels like. It's the same force from the floor, right? but it feels totally different because I spread it out over time. It doesn't make my brain go at the top of my skull. Okay? So that's one option that we have. The other option is to increase the area over which the force is applied. Okay? So one of the tricks that they teach you in judo is that if you get thrown, that you put your arm out and you time slapping the mat at the same time as your body hits the mat because now I've increased the surface area that I've spread that force out. Again in gymnastics they do that, right? Sometimes you'll see them land with their legs apart and then they'll pull their feet together to finish. Right? This increases the base, the area of the force application and then I can stand up, right? Hitting the floor with my arm increases the area that the force is being applied to. And both of those things help me to absorb ground reaction forces. Right? Because it hurts if you don't. Right? You're coming down with an amazing amount of force. The floor is going to push back with a load of force. It hurts. Right? So we want to absorb that force as best we can. Okay. So in our fundamental motor skills, we could apply this idea to catching. Right? So if I am teaching catching, or when I was in school and I was taught catching, very well because I'm really bad at catching. I'm even worse at catching than I am at throwing. Um, one of the things we tell beginners to do, right, is that when they catch the ball, to pull the ball into your chest. Has anybody heard that cue before? You say you catch it and pull it to your chest? Yeah, right? Yeah, I, I was taught to catch it and like hug it. Hug it? And hug it. That's it? Catch? Yeah. Hug. yeah, hug, right? One of the reasons for that, not only does it make it safer, right? You're less likely to drop the ball. But one of the reasons is if you keep your hands out here and the ball has been thrown really hard, Right? And it hits your hands. It is going to sting like bilio, and it's going to be hard for you to close your hands around that ball. But by when the ball makes contact, you absorb it, you increase the time over which the force is applied. 
takes a bit of the sting out if it's a hard ball. Right? Also makes it more usable, right? Then I then I'm I've got it, I'm not gonna drop it. Typically the goal of catching is either to finish the play because I won the point or to pass the ball on to the next player, in which case I have to have it secure. Stable front to back there. 
If I want to be stable front to back, I need a split this way, right? Oops. Okay. So my base of support has to be wider to provide more stability, right? The other thing I can do is lower my center of gravity towards the floor, all right? Because if I'm up on tiptoes, as tall as I can be, I'm much less stable than if I'm down here. Right? So those of you who are football players know this. Right? I want to be down low. Right? Feet wide, butt down. And then I hit both of those points. So, then if I want to improve my capability of equilibrium, I want to increase my balance, the first thing I have to do is increase stability. The other thing I have to do for balance, because to do this, right, I have to be really strong. My coordination has got to be good and my proprioception has to be good. So that means I have to be able to recognize, or at least my brain has to be able to recognize, even if I'm not recognizing it consciously, that I am about to be off balance, right? This is why I recommend doing a lot of closed eye work with your PE students, with your clients, with your athletes because we rely heavily on our vision to tell us what's going on. And we don't always pay attention to all the proprioceptive and kinesthetic information that we're getting that tells us we're going off balance, right? But if I do a lot of stuff with my eyes shut, my brain learns to pay a little bit more attention to that information because it's not like the information is going to the brain, right? The sensory organs don't have any option to not send the information, right? It is going. It's just the brain chooses to prioritize vision, okay? So this is a good example here, right? This is, um, let's say they're gonna do a squat or a pull, right? To be on balance, your center of gravity has to be over the base of support. It does not have to be in the middle of the base of support, that's the most on balance you can be, but I'm not off balance. I don't fall until my center of gravity moves outside my base of support. So the bigger the base of support, the harder it is to become off balance because the further your center of gravity has to move to get outside the base of support. If the base of support is very narrow, you don't have to move very far to be off balance. Okay. So again, this applies all the time, right? If we look at running, if we look at someone who is a really good runner, in order to run, I have to fall. Right? The trick to running is that as I fall, I'm strong enough to move my legs and my feet in time I don't land on my nose. Right? But if I try to stay on balance and run, ah, it's going to take forever to finish that marathon. I have to fall in order to move forwards. So we use this idea of the center of gravity and the base of the support all the time in 
movement skills. We just don't cognitively correlate the idea to the movement, right? We just do it. But that's what the class is about. Right? We've got to start having more cognitive awareness of what we're observing and why are we seeing the motor pattern that we're seeing and what do I need to do to tweak that motor pattern to make it more competent so that this person is more successful at the motor pattern, not at the outcome. Right? So, if we want to be highly stable, okay, so the baby learning to walk or learning to run, or the 90 year old who is still moving around, right, then what we want is a, an easier version, a simpler version of the skill, right? And we want a wide base of support because that makes the skill easier, okay? So I'm going back to my gymnastics, I'm afraid. So here's the stable version, okay? You can see that her hands are on the floor wider than her shoulders. So she has increased her base of support. And by doing the double stack here, she has lowered her center of gravity towards the floor. Right? So this version of a handstand is theoretically, for people who can do handstands, much easier, much more stable. Right? She can probably sit there for like five minutes and not move. Okay? However, this version is a totally different picture. Right? Now I've got an itty bitty base of support because I'm doing a handstand on one hand. She's actually not doing a handstand, she's doing a, a one arm giant. But or a twisting giant, but for the sake of our picture, oh, she could be doing that. So she's got one hand, right? Look at the size of this base of support here. Look at the base of support here. And she is long and tall and narrow. Oops, that's not what I want to do. So that moves her center of gravity as far away from her support as possible. So this is extremely unstable, much more difficult version of a handstand. So, questions? No? No? Uh, no. <laughs> I have a um, it, it may be stupid, but the picture of a girl that is hand standing on one hand. <laughs> is that like a picture motion or so was she doing like a, a like a jump or something and then they caught her in that position or is she actually handstanding? Um, okay. I suspect because it doesn't look like she's on the beam, so you do see one-handed handstands on the beam, but it looks to me like she's on the bar. So I suspect she's doing a giant circle and she's taken one hand off in order to pirouette and they've managed to catch it with a, with a good camera at the start of the pirouette. That's my suspicion, but I don't know for sure. 
I didn't take yeah, the photo. That's not that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but that, you know, that one-handed handstand um, here for someone who's really good at handstand. I mean, if you look at sports acro partners, you will see the top person, and that. So this hand is is on the hands of the bottom person, and they'll go into a one-handed handstand there. So that that position is possible given enough skill, right? But not for most of us. <laughs> not even me, and I'm pretty good at handstands, really. Um, so, okay, what I wanted to uh, point out to you is that if you look at the class notes folder, there are two articles there about using biomechanics, okay? They're practitioner articles, so they're very, very easy to read. They're written for PE teachers. So whilst they use the theory and the science, they're worded very easily for you to read them, okay? One of them is called Applying Newton's Apple to Elementary PE. And the other one is called Biomechanical Concepts for the Physical Educator. All right? So I want you to make sure that you read those two articles because they will help you. Hopefully some of my examples have helped. But those will also help you to visualize how you use this information. There's no point in having the info and not using it. Right? The whole point of coming to class is to gain more information that will make you a better teacher, better coach, better trainer, right? whatever you want to be. Okay, So make sure that you read those. They will help you think about how to apply the material from Chapter 3. Okay? And that's the end of Chapter 3. So uh, on, what day is today? Tuesday, right? So on Thursday we will start what used to be chapter 4, but is now chapter 8, I believe. Check the syllabus, make sure. Um, I've only used this new textbook once last semester, so I'm still getting used to it. Let me have a look here. Chapter 8, chapter 8, chapter 8. Yes. So... We will start chapter 8 on Thursday, okay, um, tomorrow uh, we are going to look at some of the uh, theories and the research around modeling for motor skills, okay. So I'll see you tomorrow at lunchtime, 12 o'clock, have a good day. It's going to be lovely and warm. Thank you, ma'am. Have a good day. Yeah. It will be a bit windy today, but it's going to be worse tomorrow. So make the most of the sunshine and the warm weather and the slightly lower wind today. Okay? Yeah. Okay. All right, gang. See you tomorrow.